that's great. <laughs> yeah, that was definitely a first for me. I've never seen an embedded built-in trampoline. Yeah. Usually they're in someone's backyard, right. I feel. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that was pretty fun. That was at uh, also at a sort of interesting infrastructural spot, which was here. It was underneath this pedestrian bridge. Mm -hmm. And I think this pedestrian bridge is pretty cool because it was crowdfunded. Okay. Um, yeah, so instead of being like a municipal project, it's something, you know, they wanted to preserve this area. And, and so, you know, they just kind of crowdfunded and then, you know, there were some setbacks with it. And then eventually they were able to really bring that project to life. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman, and that was Emily Stutz, a special education teacher from Brooklyn, New York, who's become fascinated by urbanism and all things active mobility. And she's just returned from a street redesign program uh, that took place in Germany and in the Netherlands, uh, including some uh, familiar faces, uh, including Lior Steinberg, as well as George Leo. Uh, so without further ado, let's get right to it with Emily Stutz. Emily, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Welcome. Hi, thanks so much for having me. It's really great to be here. So, Emily, uh, I, I know that you uh, watch some of the videos and you uh, also maybe listen uh, to, to the podcast uh, frequently. As you'll know, I like to have my guests uh, introduce themselves. So who the heck is Emily? Uh, hi again. I'm Emily Stutz. Uh, I teach at PS372 in Brooklyn, New York. I'm a special education teacher there, and uh, in my free time, I like to bike around New York, um, hang out with my family, uh, and just talk about all things infrastructure. <laughs> no. Okay, so what's the backstory? How did, how did you like get engaged and interested in this sort of stuff? Uh, I really have my partner to blame. <laughs> Uh, and to think, honestly, um, he has encouraged me the whole way. Uh, and it kind of started when he bought a cargo bike back in 2018, uh, just like a Bach Feats, uh, that he put a laminated sign on, on the street. And, um, some of my students saw it, uh, as he biked to meet me at school and, uh, from there, it kind of grew into a study with the first graders where I was teaching at the time. And um, since then, I think it's just the rest is history. Yeah, that's great. That's so cool. And I think that that you and I, I, I can't remember how we originally got connected. I'm thinking it might have been in Twitter. Is, is that how or... I, I can't recall. Yeah, I think okay. it's definitely from Twitter. Okay. Um, it, back in... February, we were listening to your podcast mm -hmm. um, when you had Megan Ramey on. Ah, uh, okay. Yes. Yeah. And that podcast episode kind of sparked uh, me to host our school's first ever bike to school day group ride. Nice. Along with some amazing parents at my school, including um, the Brooklyn organizer for transportation alternatives here in New York. Right. Uh, Kathy Park Price, she was an amazing partner on that effort. Right. And I just pulled up your your, your Twitter uh, account here, your Twitter page, and I see a nice little gazelle in the background there. Uh, a nice Dutch uh, a bike. And, uh, and, 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 and you are quite active out on Twitter, especially in the uh, hashtag uh, bike Twitter <laughs> realm <laughs> in terms of uh, all things good infrastructure and safe streets and trying to encourage more uh, people oriented places. So you just got back from summer school. I did. You yeah. Did. So uh, tell us a little bit about um, what that was all about in terms of, uh, you know, how did you hear about the summer school class? Where, who who organized it? And what was that all about? Sure. I um, I went to summer school, Remaking the Street Summer School, which was hosted by EIT, the European Institute for Technology, um, and TUM, the Technical University of Munich, and also Humankind, which is an organization based in Rotterdam. Um, and I heard about it because I'd actually taken Remaking, no, Unraveling the Cycling City, um, 
Coursera and they sent like an email blast out to everyone who had taken the course. And I knew, especially when I saw humankind on there, that it was something that I would be really interested in. And that I think, uh, you know, at the time I thought, you know, I can definitely see how this would connect to safer streets in New York, uh, especially safer streets for kids. Uh, because at earlier this year in May, Lior, who runs Humankind, uh, one of the co-founders, had actually visited my class virtually to read aloud his children's book, The Car That Wanted to Be a Bike. And so, you know, just having met Lior and knowing what a kind guy uh, he is, I thought, uh, this is something I want to be part of. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And and that was Lior. We that we made his smiling face there on screen as part of that uh, that project and uh, and yeah, the book is is such a sweet sweet book and uh, I'll, I'll make sure that there's links in in the uh, show notes in the video description uh, for uh, Lior's book and uh, and I've had him on the podcast as well and and we've talked about the book. So, it's fantastic. And uh, so so that was the 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 seed was planted there. You were, you know, you're like, okay, I've I've done the unraveling, the cycling city, and and uh, you you heard about this class. Now, it's one thing to do like a a remote class, and most of these Coursera classes obviously are, are remote classes. But this was not a remote thing. No, we did start <laughs> the first two modules online, but then yep. uh, we were really lucky to have a chance to spend a week in Munich. And a week in Rotterdam, uh, really active in those places and working on street experiments, which I thought was the most amazing thing. I remember seeing in the kind of pre slides, uh, like we had like a virtual cafe uh, to overview some logistics. And they said, bring your clothes for construction. We will be building a parklet. And I was just filled with so much glee at the idea of actually being able to implement a street experiment. Uh, in Munich. And we did. Yeah. And uh, you sent along some gra visuals of, of some of the pre-trip stuff. So what's going on here in these uh, series of posters? So on these posters, you can see uh, these are not part of an adult-oriented class. Uh, but actually, one of our assignments for the online portion was to write an article about a uh, street experiment that we've heard of. And so I was teaching summer school with my fourth graders from this past school year. Mm -hmm. uh, and we actually took on this project together uh, and became investigative journalists ah, nice. uh, in our summer school class. And so I chose to write my article about the Park Slope Play Street, which is now the Park Slope Pedestrian Plaza. Oh, nice. And we took a trip there, and the kids gave lots of feedback about what their hopes and dreams for the streets were, and especially for the Park Slope Play Street. And then here you can see uh, sort of the start of our article forming. So it was nice. really amazing to be able to do this together with my students. Fantastic. <laughs> and and fun. I just I have to shout out that actually the shirt I'm wearing was a gift from one of the students before I left for the class. Oh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. And, and uh, I, I think we've got, uh, this is a, a photo of, of um, Happy Bike to School Day. <laughs> so Yeah. So this great. is, uh, this is what Megan Ramey inspired, what yeah. you inspired, John. So thank you so much for that. Absolutely. It, it just warms my heart when I get that feedback that uh, some of the episodes that I've had and some of the videos that I've produced have inspired people to, to take change in, in their neighborhoods and their communities. Uh, that's the whole reason why we're doing this stuff. So it, that's so much fun. So you sign up and uh, you're, you're, you're getting excited about you know, going out there, you have some pre-course work before the actual trip. Uh, walk us, walk us through the the scenario. Where where do you start off, and and what's the what's the the week look like when when you're out over there for summer school? So we first started in Munich. Um, I actually came on Tuesday. Was my first day with the group, uh, and 
So on Monday, they'd actually visited Piazza Zanetti. And I was able to swing by later on and see the piazza. And I think there are some photos of that uh, available as well. It was a really bright, colorful plaza. It was so beautiful. And I think one of my favorite parts about it was that there was a pizza box container uh, at the piazza so that if you want to hang out with friends, you have a place to recycle your pizza boxes, Uh, which I think, I mean, what better way to think about human-centered planning than to imagine what kinds of recycling people will need to be doing. Um, Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I just think that was such a nice touch. After that, when I joined on Tuesday, we really started group work. And over the course of the two weeks, we had a huge overarching project to redesign a bit of Augustenstrasse, which is a street near Tomb, the Technical okay. University of Munich. And um, so we worked in groups of five or six, and we were actually out on the street uh, evaluating what the situation is like on Augustenstrasse, choosing a chunk of the street that we would redesign and a spot where we would build a parklet. Uh, for people who don't know what a parklet is, it's like a small park that takes up one or two parking spaces, uh, possibly more parking spaces if you really get the chance to make a long-term change. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, it was just a really great opportunity to work together with people that I wouldn't usually get to work with as a teacher, you know, like uh, people who are specialists in urban transport and urban planning architects, um, user experience specialists. I mean, it was a really diverse group uh, of people from all over the globe, too. I mean, it was really great. Yeah, so that was kind of the overarching experience. But within that, we had a lot of sort of smaller lectures, hearing from people who are doing that work in Munich. There's one group, uh, Benny and Eliza that are running a group building parklets. Uh, On the picture you showed just a few moments ago, Mm -hmm. Benny was actually getting a a Munich bike share. So there he is. Yeah, that's Benny. There's Benny. Uh, Okay. (laughs) So he and the group that he works with, they're actually on the ground building parklets in neighborhoods where neighbors express interest. Got it. And so we got a chance to hear from them and, They're the group that led the initiative to build the parklet uh, next to Tomb. And let's uh, let's pull up some uh, photos here of the uh, uh, of this parklet area. Uh, So I'll scroll through these. Why don't you just kind of uh, describe uh, what's what's happening in this in this environment here? Yeah. So this is a parklet that they built earlier in the pandemic. Uh, It's in the neighborhood where they live and it's seems to have been a huge hit. I mean, as you can see, it's remained. I think these parklets are amazing because they provide seating for folks. They also provide um, bike parking, a space for a little free library, a space for bottle recycling, which is a huge program in Germany. And then as you can see, the feedback portion is really taken seriously. Uh, So there's a place to do surveys and really give your feedback. So this was the type of modular parklet that we built uh, next to Tomb on a little side street right next to the university. So you can see from the ground up this parklet coming to life. Uh, From the construction team working on building the structure bit by bit uh, to then sort of moving in those larger pieces uh, to really put together the frame and then you know, even the small details like adding greenery and even some like solar powered party lights, it really just made such a welcoming space. And you can see the finished product there. They just turn out so beautiful. I mean, who wouldn't want to be there? Uh, And you can tell that because when we were working on it, people continuously stopped by asking, um, you know, what was going on and you know, I think some people from the neighborhood even stopped to help work on it or to bring waters by for them while they were working on it. Yeah. Um, and then when when people went back later on to check on it, um, I know Simone from the university 
went back later to check and see how things were going after it was finished. And there were people just hanging out, relaxing on the structure and yeah. seemed to really enjoy it. Yeah. And it's quite beautiful. I mean, I, I, I paused on this one uh, mainly because you look so happy <laughs> and, uh, and the greenery. Uh, yeah, you're right. It's just so well done. And who wouldn't want, you know, their, you know, their, their street space, you know, uh, what was previously just storage for a private automobile, you know, out in public realm, who wouldn't want to have this? I mean, this is fantastic. Yeah. And I think that is the whole premise of the street experiments sort of movement that Mm -hmm. we were learning about is that, you know, when you first think about what we're used to seeing, which would be vehicles here uh, to sort of a shift, it is a little hard to imagine Yeah, maybe at first for people who are just so used to the side of the street being used for parking. Yeah. But once you really see it come to life, it's, it's almost hard to imagine it any, any other way, yeah. right. Than a joyful, uh, well-constructed green communal space. Yeah. Uh, and I think that was really my main takeaway is that, you know, these, the spaces on the street, I mean, it's something that to me has felt a bit instinctual for a while. Right. Just because of all I've learned from, you know, from people like you. Uh, but seeing it in person and seeing it in a way that really is for the community, that's not just a dining shed run by a business. It's not commercial, but it really is community right. based. Um it really leaves me with a sense of longing and also a sense of uh, what now, what can I do? You know, yeah, like a push, yeah. a motivation in myself. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, how long did it take for this to, to come together? It looked like through flipping through the photos, it looked like it happened fast. Yeah, this really, well, the, I have to say the permit process uh, was something that Toom had spent a while working on and they said they only got the permit uh, like maybe the Thursday before we all arrived okay. to actually build the parklet. So that prior takes some time. And that's something that, you know, everyone we spoke with who has involvement in that process was really honest about, mm-hmm. but the actual construction of the parklet took a day. Okay. Um, I think it's partly the nature of the modular units, the exactly. fact that some things are yeah. already built. And then yeah. also the fact that like Benny and Elisa and the people we were working with were just, pretty, pretty good at getting these things done yeah, in a yeah. timely manner now after so many repeated opportunities. Yeah, but, yeah. um, yeah. And, and I'll, and I'll note that, you know, there was still cars available to, you know, or there's still spaces for, for cars to be parked and that's what you saw in the background there. So it's, it's not like you, you know, took over the street, you know, the entire street, you're, you're literally taking one or two parking spaces, turning it into a parklet, um, I think it's, you know, it's such a positive thing to see the some of these photos uh, when you got into uh, to Munich. Um, I want to scroll through these a little bit because uh, I've been to Munich. I've I've profiled it before. It's been a while. It's been back since uh, 2015 when I was there. Um, what was that experience like for you, you know, arriving in Munich and and then starting to, to get around? Well, I actually arrived into Frankfurt. Oh, okay. Yeah, I flew into Frankfurt, and then I was quickly able to transfer to a train to go okay. the rest of the journey to Munich. And I think for me, that was, I mean, it was just so pleasant Yeah. to be able to hop off the plane, well, grab I think my I, luggage. I think I then, have something here from you. It's it's a TikTok. You, you're obviously yeah. active in, on TikTok. I'm not. This is a product of the class, actually. Okay, this is a product of the class. Well, let's let's press play on this and see what it uh, what it says. I need to make sure we have some volume on it. Assuming there's volume to this. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> So, uh, so it was, that was part of the class, the, the, the class that you were, that you were doing. So it was part yeah. of, you know, framing things. Yeah. So we had a challenge, uh, in week two, 
when we were in uh, Rotterdam, we took a day trip to the University of Amsterdam and uh, George Liu challenged us to make our urbanism TikTok. Uh, and so okay. uh, another TikTok in the in the drive that maybe we can watch later on is of uh, Alexander Pline, which I think is your favorite intersection. One of them. Yes. Yeah. 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 It's and, hard. To, uh, it's hard to choose. But <laughs> <laughs> well, there are so many. Well, and I think I think we had this conversation uh, out on uh, on Twitter is that it is one of my favorite intersections um, and mainly it's a favorite intersection because it's so different. So I'll, I'll try to find that TikTok and then we can talk about that, but continue. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that was one of the locations for making a TikTok, And so I actually had to download the app mm-hmm. uh, to even complete this project. But now that I'm into it, I'm like, Oh, this is the place to be. Uh, so the TikTok that we just watched, of the train footage was sort of the follow-up to that because I promised Sam Balto, uh, Coach Balto, that I would make at least two more before I left the trip. And so that was one of the two. Yeah, so on, I mean, just being able to hop on a train like that is not something I can really fathom, even in a pretty well-connected state like New York. Yeah. Um, to be able to go from an airport to a train to get you somewhere three hours away, like, right. but almost like a door to door situation, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, Cause even once I arrived in Munich, it was just a matter of like a couple of blocks to get to the hotel where I was staying. Yeah. Um, and it was just so pleasant and the landscape was amazing. And I was really able to like relax and take it in. Uh, without, you know, without being behind the wheel of a car. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. That's cool. Okay. Well, I found the other TikTok. All right. <laughs> Let's, Let's roll it. with it. <laughs> I'll turn the volume back up again. Here we go. It's mayhem. How is it? Cars, mopeds, trams, pedestrians, and so many cyclists. Okay, oddly enough, there is no automated signaling to tell these folks where to go. So how do they know when to stop and who has right of way? Go, go, go. It's human instinct and empathy leading the way. There's eye contact. People notice other users on the street. Go. There are a few near misses, and it seems a bit hard for visitors to understand. But all in all, what a humane design. As an experiment in 2016, and it's been going for six years. This part of all, as awareness increased, crashes decreased. What intersection in your city deserves this loving treatment? We're learning this and more in re- <laughs> That's great. <laughs> sure. So, yeah, and, and again, I, I, I had the opportunity to visit that particular intersection in uh, 2018 and 2019. And so it's, it's been in, in place uh, for some time now. And so, yeah, it took a little bit of time for them to get used to, but it really is about that concept of um, taking away the, those control devices, the, you know, because one of the things that happens when you take away a control device, like a stop sign or a stop light, specifically a stop light is it, it, really forces people to make eye contact and communicate and and negotiate through that space, which is one of the reasons why I like um, slow speed roundabouts, you know, the Dutch style slow speed roundabouts with bike and pedestrian priority. (laughs) I always like to point that out. Uh, I love them, especially because people are driving much slower and then people walking and biking can make that contact, that human contact with uh, with the drivers. And then this just takes it up another notch. (laughs) Yeah, I think, you know, also the fact that it started as an experiment, you know, that was the whole nature of this class is what you can accomplish when you just try something and it doesn't have to be permanent. Uh, It it doesn't, you don't have to say we're doing this and it's going to be done, but you can really just try something and, and you say, if it doesn't work, it can go back to the way it was. 
Yeah, yeah, and absolutely. Even for for Alexander Pline, like that's how it started. I think that's yeah. great. Yeah. Uh, in this little uh, packet of photos that you sent, you've you've got uh, this little uh, uh, image here. Uh, what's going on here? This is actually on Augustenstrasse, the street that we were challenged to redesign. Okay. And you can see that uh, there's some commercial activity happening. Uh, but I loved the juxtaposition of the DHL truck, yeah. uh, the giant DHL truck and the tiny UPS um, e-bike delivery right. uh, service. And so I, you know, I put that there also because it shows the way that parking is an issue. Uh, yeah. for commercial deliveries. And so we wanted to illustrate that in our street redesign uh, with our group, but also because I was so excited because New York City is getting the UPS <laughs> cargo bike oh, good. Uh, delivery service. It's kind of piloting here. And so, you know, I was just excited to show that like, okay, this is possible. Like, a lot of people think it's not possible in a big city, but right. yeah. um, cargo bikes are powerful. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, you, you do have a, a street remix, a street mix uh, a, a graphic here. Let's let's pull this up. Uh, what's going on in this uh, little video? This was part of our online component, and you can see the cars are just flying away, whoosh, off of Halsey Street, which is the street where I live in Brooklyn. And then we're sort of redesigning that street and creating a more human friendly design or um as we learn in the course streets for people not for traffic right and yeah. so on my street i imagined having wider sidewalks a uh, better bus shelter as opposed to just a post yeah. and the hot hot sun at the corner right uh bi-directional bike lane and then really i think where i live um it would be such an ideal spot for a bus lane because we have bi-directional car traffic, bi-directional bus lanes, right? or like uh, bus traffic. We don't have bus lanes, just right. bus traffic. And we watch out our front window all the time and see how the buses get just stuck behind lines of double parked cars. Right. Um, and really, it's just not a safe street for biking on. So. Yeah. That was my reimagining, my hopes and dreams, as I call them with my yeah, students, yeah. Yeah, yeah. of what could be. That's neat. So you've been drinking from the fire hose here <laughs> with urbanism and urban mobility. Uh, what's that been like? I mean, somebody who, who's coming from a background where you, you didn't go to school for this, you know, how's, you know, is this just like super, super fun to like, you know, absorb all of this? I mean, it sounds like you have a very good grasp of all of it. I think the thing that I've realized, especially when I took Unraveling the Cycling City and um, also just having conversations with my partner as we listen to podcasts and, uh, you know, watch YouTube videos is how much I actually don't know. Um, you know, I mentioned kind of the instinct that I'd had about people-centered planning. Uh, even from a really young age, I hated driving. Um, I, my like memory of getting my permit, and my mom's going to be so mad about this, but I'm going to put it out there. I remember her having to threaten to ground me to get me to pass a car when we were on the way home from the DMV. And like, I don't know, the, the feeling of driving just felt so icky to me as a young person. And now as a teacher, kind of experiencing a city with young people, uh, I, I see, you know, just what could be, I guess, right. you know, if, if we really created spaces that were um, joyful and safe and encouraged independence. Right. Um, so it is really fun to learn about. And sometimes really frustrating, but I have to say like the community of people that have kind of, you know, that I, I was previously so unaware of has been the best part. Yeah. Um, I think like, you know, it's not just the bike community, but I kind of put it under the umbrella of the bike community because I'm always saying like the bike community is just the best. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. And what's great about this too is, and I've had several conversations with uh, other guests that have been on the podcast and, and obviously many conversations with people in the community is that this stuff isn't rocket science. This is not that difficult. We've just been sort of blinded to it because it's what we've grown up in and what we see around us. And so we're like fish in water and we have no appreciation for the water around us. And, uh, but what, is difficult and what is challenging is negotiating through change and so this next graphic that i'm going to pull up here is your your stakeholder mapping graphic that you have and and it just it, to me it illustrates just how complex changes and and being able to do that and i'll uh, uh come over here and, and zoom out just a little bit so that we can make sure that we can see the entire graphic uh, just like that. There we go. So th this to me is a great illustration of why it is so hard to create um, safe streets and, and be able to, to make those transformations. So, so walk us through this part of the exercise. Sure. This is, again, part of that Augustin Strauss, the overarching project that we were working on as a group. And we really had to take time to map out uh, who is involved in the street transformation that we imagine and what their role would be. And so, as you can see, Augustin Strauss is at the center of it, but there are local players in the local government, the local community, and then also sort of um, broader scale sponsors or um, government institutions, or even the Green City EV, which is sort of an NGO and kind of broad scale um, climate focused organization. And, you know, each group plays such an important role in sort of transforming the streets. But when there are so many key players, you can see how complex it got. And we even had to like, as a group, we made a conscious choice to like cut off the line drawing because it was going to get too chaotic, but there were, there were more directions we could have gone in with the connections. And so, yeah, I think it does definitely speak to what you're saying about how with so many moving parts and so many key players, it can feel really complicated to make a change like that. But I also think that's what I really appreciate about groups like um, you can see the Stad Station, the Stad Station. Mm -hmm. I might be mispronouncing that, but um, you know, groups like that—that's Benny and Elisa's group. Okay. Uh, really on the ground, getting things done and figuring out how to make street experiments possible and how to bring them to life. Yeah, yeah. And I think what I want to do at this point is is pop on over to the, something that really exemplifies that, and that is, you know, getting something on the ground. And uh, walk us through what's going on in this series of photos. Yeah, this was by far my favorite moment of the whole trip. Um, we went on a summer streets tour. And at one of the summer streets, they happened to be having this amazing street experiment called Strasse Oase. And it was really a child-centered play street in action on one of the summer streets in Munich, uh, put on by an organization called Culture Cloud. Um, you know, they really just brought out tons of uh, small motor and gross motor provocations for children in the neighborhood. And the kids came out in numbers. I mean, it was really the epitome of build it and they will come because there were kids all over that street going from, you know, this, this was the area where I spent a lot of time at sort of this small scale sensory provocations. Um, but on the other end, there were like giant boxes and, you know, long sticks and huge rolls of fabric that the kids could build with. And, and they really just filled that street with, you know, paintings and designs and an ice cream parlor made out of a cardboard box that you can see in the background there. Uh, it was, I mean, it was just a place for kids. And I really think that this is what streets could be if we let them. 
Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, we, that one day we were there, I stayed for a little while longer, but I actually ended up going back the next day and working at the street experiment, okay. uh, for a couple of hours, you know, just spending time hanging out with the kids. Um, you know, I, all of those kids spoke German and I don't speak even a little bit of German and it was still amazing to see how we could really connect through play yeah, and how that street made it possible. Yeah. You know, I think play is really a form of universal language uh, and having spaces like that that provoke play amongst generations because there were grandparents there with their grandkids, there were parents there engaging with their kids and also parents there who could let their kids run freely knowing that they would be safe while they could just take a minute to hang out on a bench on the side. Um, and you can see here, uh, Eduardo, one of the coordinators for the street experiment was kind enough to tell me a little bit about it on video. So if, maybe if we could watch that. Yeah, let's uh, hit play. So this is a um, Strasse Oase, Oasis, street oasis could be the translation. And we are basically organizing, uh, blocking the streets in Munich. Um, one week before we start the, the action, we tell the cars and the owners of the cars that they should move their cars away from the street we are using. So kids can go to the street and they can enjoy and they can build their own oasis. So the idea is like, from a street which is gray and it is made by the for the cars the kids can give them color and give them can give them their own creativity to build their own oasis in the middle of the of the city so that is uh, with uh, water with sand with we also have uh, smells that they can uh, create by themselves we have a painting for the for the floor we basically build it all materials and create an, an atmosphere where they can create their own oasis. We just give them the material and they are free to develop their creativity and create their own space in the place which they are not allowed to be, that are the streets where the cars are moving all around. Yeah. It was so cool too, because uh, you were so excited <laughs> when you came across this. You were uh, tweeting it out and, and you're just like, oh, I found the coolest thing ever. And so it was it was wonderful to to see this array of photos and, and that interview with him was just, you know, classic in terms of, you know, just what is possible, you know, if you just take that step forward and, you know, get permission to do it. So very, very powerful. Yeah, I mean, it was amazing to see yeah. and to see what the kids produced. And, you know, there were kids that were just so focused on, you know, whatever craft they were making. And then there were kids who could just run uh, yeah. freely. And to see that happening in the street, a place, like he said, that's usually forbidden for kids. Um, you know, it, it made it really special. So we've got another one here. Uh, this is a series of, of photos. Why don't you walk us through what's uh, what's happening in this particular image here? This is in Rotterdam, and it was another hands-on project. I have to give it up for the uh, people who planned this to Anna and Lior and Benjamin and Simone, uh, Mario, George, like, I really got to shout them out because they made this such a hands-on experience um, that we got to participate in NK Table Whipping, which is like a project uh, and competition. I love that part, that it's a friendly competition between Rotterdam and Amsterdam to see how many sidewalk tiles can be removed from the facade and replaced with greening. And so uh -huh. here you can see we were digging up those tiles, taking them in the wheelbarrow around back, and they were being used to build sort of a planter, like a concrete barrier as a planter for the area in the back underneath that crane. And the reason this is happening is to really allow for permeable surfaces because they get so much rainwater and it's becoming more common to have heavier rainfall, um, that they want spaces that are permeable and also green. And so they're replacing these cobblestones with 
um, soil so that the water can really get into the ground as opposed to just building up on top of the concrete surfaces. Yeah. Uh, but it and, also just made it so much brighter and more beautiful. And what's areas. really, yeah, what's really, really neat about um, Rotterdam, and this came up in, in a recent episode that I had with uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Billy Fields, uh, is that an intentionality of that they are expressing to try to add more greenery to you know the the street space and 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 it, there's like like I said there's a competition there's programs there's like initiatives to to try to add that little bit of greenery to the uh, you know to the streetscape and uh, so what did you think of Rotterdam? I thought Rotterdam was a great city. Having only been to Amsterdam and Nijmegen in the past, it was nice to see a new city in the Netherlands. Um, but I could also see sort of the lingering or, you know, maybe ongoing car centric nature. I have to say, it felt a lot more like being in Brooklyn than being in Amsterdam did. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that was interesting for me, that sort of feeling of like, okay, there's a little more chaos than I feel we experienced in Amsterdam. Yeah. But on the other hand, like it was, you know, I, I thought of you one day because we went to like a beach in the city mm -hmm. and it wasn't like in New York where you have to like, you have to take a train or a ferry and go really far out to get to the beach. Yeah. Uh, it was like, it was just right there in one of the canals. Yeah. And I mean, people were out in the water swimming. There were boats there. Uh, someone was like uh, water skiing on the back of a boat. I mean, it doesn't get much more active than that. Yeah, yeah. It looks like we have another TikTok here. It says Amster Rotterdam. I love you. Yeah, this was a beautiful apartment complex. Someone, someone. <laughs> <laughs> And you can see the greenery just in your, your pan as you're going around here. Which is just one of the neat things that they're trying to do in, you know, in that environment is, again, they're being very, very intentional about, you know, doing what they can. Because when we really look at Rotterdam from uh, the historical context of what happened after World War II, they really built back on a modernist, lots of concrete everywhere, really, really wide streets. And the, the city ended up becoming dead and sterile and, and just didn't feel livable. And hence, nobody wanted to live in Rotterdam uh, unless they were in one of the few historic neighborhoods that survived the bombing. Um, but uh, it's it's been wonderful to see that greening approach and bringing that in. Uh, but the other thing that's fun about Rotterdam is they have a, a lot of whimsy to them, and they try to make things fun. And so it looks like somebody found a, a street trampoline here. What's going on here? <laughs> that's great. <laughs> <laughs> so you found a street trampoline. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, that was definitely a first for me. I've never seen an embedded built-in trampoline. Yeah. Usually they're in someone's backyard, right. I feel. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that was pretty fun. That was at uh, also at a sort of interesting infrastructural spot, which was here. It was underneath this pedestrian bridge. Mm -hmm. And I think this pedestrian bridge is pretty cool because it was crowdfunded. Okay. Um, yeah, so instead of being like a municipal project, it's something, you know, they wanted to preserve this area. And and so, you know, they just kind of crowdfunded and then, you know, there were some setbacks with it. And then eventually they were able to really bring that project to life. I think it shows what can happen, you know, that it really has to be a combination of sort of bottom up and top down approach of grassroots and municipal. And I think in general, I find the Netherlands so inspiring because of that, you know, because this sort of stopped the Kindermord movement back in the 70s that really was grassroots with moms uh, wanting to stop the killing of children that became sort of cemented and lives in their policy, their planning policy now. Yeah. Um, 
And again, you could see some parallels in in Brooklyn, in New York. I mean, there's there is a a growing movement of, of of parents and activists, you know, trying to do what we can to make our streets safer, uh, because it's it's just completely unacceptable uh, that we have any fatalities out on our streets, and especially of children. So, yeah, yeah, this whole conversation I've had in the back of my mind a four year old who was killed uh, this past weekend in Queens. Um, you know, it, I mean, it's hard not to think about those kids. Um, yeah. I love when, this photo that, that we have here, too, because it, it, it kind of exemplifies, uh, you know, the the reality of, of Rotterdam, which is a very much a North American context type of reality. And you can see how, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're taking steps to try to, um, you know, take back some of the space and the, the strategic use of bollards uh, to do that. And yet you still see, you know, some relatively, you know, modern isk you know, buildings in the background there. And so they're really striving to claw back that space away from the automobile uh, because their, their environment, especially in the, in the newer areas of Rotterdam, uh, looked very much like any other large, relatively new city yeah it's i mean it it's a great example of what can be here we go yeah <laughs> this is what it's all about <laughs> if you could have this your doggy is. in <laughs> so when you look back at at these uh this experience that you've had uh, how, how long have you been back now a week a week, a, a full solid week. Yeah. So you're, you're, you know, the jet lag is over and you're, you're getting back into things. What really bubbles up as to, you know, the, the thoughts that are most prominent on your mind, um, you know, from this experience? I think the main thing that, that, that comes up for me because the street was all about, or because the course was all about street experiments, the main thing that comes up for me is like, what can I do? Uh, And it's something that had kind of been on my mind beforehand, um, you know, about what, as an individual, as a member of a community, what specific actions can I take? But the idea of street experiments, you know, it really just, it's very compelling because it shows that as individuals a lot of times it's easy to feel powerless um but there are things that we can do and and as you can see from the parklets you know one or two parking spaces nothing is too small you know so even this weekend as we were biking we biked summer streets here in new york and sort of seeing you know block parties which before like were always so exciting for me to bike on those streets where block parties were happening, but then I would just feel a sense of frustration that it wasn't for longer. And now thinking about the power that those spaces have and how to sort of bring that to a systemic or long-term change. Or maybe the block party is the systemic long-term change, you know? I mean... I don't know. I've just tried to come at it from like a much different standpoint. Whereas before I was feeling sort of frustrated or like a lot of things could be a dead end. Now I'm really trying to think about the possibilities um, that could be. I don't know if that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And it seems like you have an expanding tribe of, of, you know, people who are are working in this area. Uh, So this is your group. Yeah, this was the amazing group of of students that were all in the class. Uh, It was a really cool mix of internal EIT students and then some external students as well, like myself. Um, And everyone there with their skill set and their passion, like it was just so amazing to see. you know, some of the students had already been bringing projects to life in their own communities. And, um, you know, it, it really gives me so much hope for the future, too. 
And was it an international crew? I mean, obviously you were coming in from Brooklyn. Uh, where, where, uh, what other places were people coming in from? Uh, some, some folks were coming from Colombia, okay. Slovakia, France, um, Germany. There were some other folks from the U.S. Uh, that had also been studying in Sweden or Barcelona or um, Helsinki, um, Estonia, Mongolia, Serbia by way of Israel and headed towards Saudi Arabia, wow. uh, Lagos, Nigeria. I mean, the list really goes on. <laughs> I'm, I'm impressed you remembered as many as you did. And it looks like you made some good friends, too. Yeah. Oh, so this is actually a photo of someone that uh, it was a connection from New York, actually. Uh, I participated in a research project for the BMW Group's e-bike study. Okay. And it was really cool to be able to meet the researcher in person, Manuel, who lives oh. in Munich. Yeah. So that's what you see here. He gave us a very authentic Munich experience. Yes. <laughs> the beer garden in English garden. I love it. That's yeah. fantastic. And, and we, we, we have to to say hi to Leo or two. So there's, yes, we do. <laughs> this was the photo that, that we took to send to my students who were Excellent. still having summer school back here in Brooklyn. Yeah. Yeah. That's so great. Um, is there anything that we haven't touched upon that you'd like to, to leave the audience with at this point? I think, you know, I don't know what the active towns and teacher overlap is. I mean, I know there's, you know, Coach Balto, um, Megan, and hopefully <laughs> you know. Megan. Hopefully yeah, she's a not a teacher, audience. but she's yeah, yeah. It's a growing audience, and thanks to you yeah. too. Thanks to you because you have have tagged us in quite a few uh, uh, tweets, and and, uh, and 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 this is huge too because I used to teach. Um, the bike ed safety classes to fourth graders. Oh, so wow. I, so it's, it's fourth grade is a magical age because it's, it's at that, that they're old enough to really accept a lot of this stuff. And that's one of the reasons why a fourth grade and fifth grade are, are the grades where we really get into uh, teaching those uh, safety skills and, and really, you know, helping them uh, because hopefully we're seeing more and more kids transitioning to being able to, to get to school on under their own power. Yeah. I think it's in curbing traffic where they talk about, you know, when their son got to that double digit age and they were also just moving to the yeah. Netherlands and uh, the independence that he had, Yes. Uh, when the Bruntlets moved, being able to just set them kind of free. Yeah. Uh, and so, I, yeah, it's totally true what you say about, you know, kids being able to have that independence. They're ready for that independence, I think, at that age. Yeah. Um, and I just I think there's so much space in education for bike education, for talking about urban design, for kids to really be able to imagine and there's a lot of talk right now about kids being able to have hopes and dreams about the kind of school year that they want. And right. why can't we also have that for the kind of cities that they want to live in? Um, and I think that's also sort of a lingering feeling that I've been having. And even yeah. with the many tools that were introduced to us in the course, it was so easy to imagine adapting those for use in an elementary classroom. Maybe yeah, and really. If, yeah, I was just going to say, in fact, uh, with uh, my interviews, both with Darcy Kitching and also with uh, Tim Gill, um, they talked uh, extensively about actually engaging children in the redesign of streets and in the redesign of public space. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's the best way to listen to kids, you know, yeah. in the same way that we get to imagine our hopes and dreams at the beginning of the school year for what each year will hold and trying to make those dreams come true. I think if that's a place where we start sort of designing our cities, it can only lead to positive outcomes for all of us. Yeah, yeah. I agree 100%. <laughs> Emily, thank you so very much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. It's been such an honor and such a pleasure having you on. Thanks. It's been a real treat to be on the podcast. Um, I listen every time. And so 
it's our Sunday brunch podcast. Oh, cool. And, yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, to be on is, is really an honor. Thank you so much for all that you do. You're really shaping our world for the better. Well, thank you. And you too, because uh, I like to say that, uh, you know, I, I'm broadcasting out and trying to pull people together and trying to spread the message and the word, but it's people like you who are actually doing the hard work of making it happen in your community. So thank you so much for doing that as well. It's, it's a joy. Thank you all so much for tuning in to episode number 152 featuring Emily Stutz from Brooklyn, New York. And if you did, please be sure to give it a thumbs up, <laughs> leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just hit that subscription button down below and be sure to ring the notifications bell right next to it. Uh, until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers.